friends, Dave Pilatus, k Missing Project. Copyrighted edition for our video channel, and that is Hawk, the executive producer. She had a bath today. She smells absolutely tremendous. And we got home, and she was so happy. So happy, huh? Oh, she loved those scratches. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you. Ain't a good girl. You do good girl. Oh yeah. Yes, the Great Pyrenees. Quite a dog, I will say. I've had German Shepherds my whole life. Had a chocolate lab. By far. These are the most <laughs> I'd say they're way up there with German Shepherds as far as intellect. Super smart. So, here's my report on Washington. Uh, we're at the Connaught Resort and Casino in, uh, just outside of Aberdeen in a small city called Ocean Shores. It's a great, great facility. I think this is the fourth time I've been there. And I've been there for Bigfoot conferences, UFO paranormal conferences, and then that's what this was this time. Had some great speakers. Had a man that was a captain in the Air Force that was in charge of nuclear silos in uh, Minot, North Dakota. They had a, a UFO fly over their nuclear silos and shut down 10 nuclear missiles simultaneously. He said that uh, they were told, it never happened, don't talk about it. And he said that uh, they have annual get-togethers now, and they all talk about it. He wrote a book, and in Missing 411, The UFO Connection, I, I highlighted the same thing that happened at Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And he went on to say that even today, he says, I stay up on technology, and he said, I don't have any idea today what could do to those missiles that happened to us in the 1960s? He says, I don't, I don't think they could do it today. So he said, whatever it was, he said, there's no way it was from this world. He said that the security guards outside that saw the UFO said it was hovering right on top. And then he said, in a flash, it went from right here straight up in the air and it was gone. He said speed couldn't even be guessed because it was so fast. Wow. Also had a retired FBI agent. His name was George. I really enjoyed talking to George. Sat down, talked to me, talked about the state of the FBI today, cases he worked on, etc. And I don't mind telling you because he, he didn't care. He wrote this book, and it was Avoiding the Sudden Stop, Climbing and Mountaineering on Rainier. I read about half the book coming home. It's great. Guiding on Rainier and other Northwest mountain adventures in the 60s. Avoiding the Sudden, sudden Stop, George Houston, H-E-U-S-T-O-N. Really, really good book. And George, I appreciated you sharing it with me. Plus we had a lot of, you know, he was in the Bay Area when I was a policeman, so we had a lot to talk about. It was fascinating topics with him. And then I met a lot of people from the Bigfoot UFO world, of course, but somebody came up to me that was a pretty big surprise. Uh, somebody who worked and was retired from the State Department. This individual had worked in Africa, the U.S., many other locations and he talked about the state of our world our state department today and let's just say he didn't have many kind things to say about it and he was vastly concerned about the world and about how the US is handling things I'm not talking politics I'm just telling you what somebody told me that came up and uh, we had other fascinating talks along the way but 
Angie and I had a really good time. Uh, the person who runs this conference is a man named uh, Johnny Manson. And Johnny's a DJ in Aberdeen. And he invited us to be on a show Friday morning. So we got up early, went into his studio. And he works for a big radio station in Aberdeen. And we got interviewed for an hour. One of the things I talked about was mental health. And Johnny had said that there had been issues in Aberdeen and Ocean Shores in the last several years about young people's mental health. So I talked about Ben, talked about me, how it affected me, and how suicide affects families and destroys families. And then on the way home, this had to be a 100,000 to one chance. On the same flight as us is the grief counselor I had for two years after Ben took his life. And we saw each other in the airport. We were on the same flight coming back to Kalispell. And Angie knew her as well. Just a, an absolutely astounding woman. And we were talking and when I was at, she, she holds a grief camp outside the city of Kalispell every year for young people who have lost a loved one in their life, whether it's just old age or suicide or whatever. And it's a grief camp and it explains how to, how to handle grief. And it's at this beautiful lake out in the mountains. It's, it's, it's great. Well, when Angie and I were there last, there was a young man, an extremely impressive young man in high school that had volunteered his time. And he was an athlete, two sport athlete, straight A student. And he was president of his high school class here in the Valley. And I asked her, I said, how he had a brother and a mom and dad. And I said, How, how's the family doing? Because I met this man. I met this boy. She said, Dave, you didn't hear? No. She said, shortly after he took his life, the mom took her life. to walk away. I'm so upset. She said it, it totally devastated what was left of the family. And the dad and the other son had to move out of the valley. It was there. There was so much bad karma here for them. And what I don't understand is. So first of all, I do understand the thinking behind the mom because I know what devastation it brings. But, but she had another young boy that had to live with this. And that's what I don't understand. The boy lost his brother. And on top of that, to lose the mom, it's just, it's just an overwhelmingly burden to carry for the rest of your life. I know we're living in tough times. I know that there's strangeness in our world. I was not ready for that yet. When we got home, I was not ready. So I don't mean to, I don't want to be a downer, but I also want you guys to know that mental health topic is huge to me still. I think about it daily. I worry about people daily. And anybody out there who thinks that this isn't a serious topic for today's world, then you probably need to leave. Suicide is a huge cause of death in 
in kids under 25. It's huge. Okay, that's enough. So, I was in Washington. Kind of, the location was just kind of underneath the uh, Olympic Peninsula in Olympic National Park. We got there a day early. Took a ride into Olympic and went to the trailhead where somebody disappeared that we had worked. Took some pictures. We'll talk about it in the future. And it's a very, very lush, thick park. It probably rains 100 inches a year there in parts. And it's overgrown. It's gorgeous. The water coming out of creeks and rivers is just perfectly clear. Why did somebody disappear at this location that we'll talk about later? I have no idea. Because when we were there on a Friday morning, May, Park Mill was almost full. In the, in the summer, I, I can't even imagine how busy that place must get, but it's gorgeous. Now, we're going to talk about a Washington case today. A Washington case that is not in the Washington book. It's something we found within the last month. And it involves a location that is near and dear to my heart, and that is Mount St. Helens. I've been there several times. It's one of the strangest places on the planet. I'm not kidding. The amount of oddities that have happened in my world at that location are off the chart. But let's get into it. <clears throat> Involves story centers on four people, but we're going to talk about two of the four right off the top. First man, his name is Clinton Smith. He was 22 years old. And his wife's name <clears throat> was named Iris Newkirk Smith, 22 years old. One of the very, very rare times I ever get a maiden name on a case. That maiden name? German. They both went missing July 6, 1913. It was a Sunday on Mount St. Helens. The couple was married in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Both were graduates of the University of Minnesota in 1913. They were super smart. Mrs. Smith initially taught history and English in high school and now was employed by a power plant in Portland, Oregon. And Mr. Smith was a very well-known electrical engineer. And the couple had a 22-month-old son named Walter who was being watched by Mr. Smith's mom in Portland. The couple had planned a vacation for a long time. They had moved out to the West Coast. Initially, they moved to Montana. They were living in Great Falls, and then they moved over to uh, Portland. They liked it. This was, this was no real populated area back then. But they were trying to plan a vacation to get up into the woods. And they decided that they were going to try to summit Mount St. Helens. St. Helens is about 52 miles northeast of Portland. And even though these, this couple was brilliant smart, they had common sense. They sought out a professional climbing guide to use them to help them summit Mount St. Helens. Brilliant. Accompanying the Smiths on their trip was a man named Randolph Carroll, who was a friend of the, Carol, uh, of the, of the Smiths. Now, Mount St. Helens, like I said, has a very, very long history of strangeness. In 1913, the summit was 9,677 feet. Not an atrocious climb, 
And it was under that 10,000 foot threshold where things get really brutal. Now, this is before the eruption on Mount St. Helens in 1980. This is what the mountain did look like. Kind of your common volcanic looking mountain up through the Cascade Range of Oregon and Washington. It was beautiful. But it was also active. Volcanically active. Now, a little bit about St. Helens. In 1924, yeah, you know, about 11 years after this incident, there was one of the most famous Bigfoot incidents of all time happened right at the base of that mountain. And it involved a group of miners who were working a mining claim on the mountain. At the end of the day, they came into their cabin and they, the cabin was pelted with rocks. And when they looked out to see what was doing it, they saw these tall, hairy, bipedal people who one of the miners had said had more of a shape like a human than an ape, but they were all hairy. Bigfoot, Sasquatch. And there's various stories about this, but the miners all had guns. And one of the miners said that he shot one of these things and it fell into a 300 foot deep canyon called Ape Canyon. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's just one of the stories. Another story, Missing 411, the UFO connection. You can watch it right now on Amazon. We'll go there right now and you can watch it. At least in the US you can. If you can't watch it on Amazon in the country you're in, try Tubi and Vimeo. So, in the 411 UFO connection, we highlighted a story where just west of Mount St. Helens, and I'm serious, it's just miles away, uh, Weyerhaeuser Corporation. And Weyerhaeuser is, a com Weyerhaeuser is a company that has huge plots of land where they grow trees. And they take them to the mill and turn them into paper products and things like that. Well, Weyerhaeuser had clear-cut a mountainside and they brought in a team of tree planters to be on the side of the hillside and replant the pine trees. Well, as the team is there, they see a UFO fly up a canyon and there was a herd of elk down in this canyon. It hovers over one elk that doesn't move. It lowers, and by some means that nobody could say that there was any grappling hooks or anything to grab it, it just somehow took this, picked it up, and flew away with it. Most of the people in the group did not speak English, so MUFON brought in a bilingual speaker and interviewed the group one at a time. All of them were deathly afraid and didn't want to go back. The guide said, well, why? And they said, we're afraid that that thing is going to take us. ka -ching. That, that report was originally given to me by Peter Davenport from National UFO Reporting Center. And it was originally his case, and he went to MUFON to get additional resources. Probably one of the most fascinating cases I've ever worked. Again right around St. Helens. And then in the Washington, Missing 411 Washington book, there are stories right around Mount St. Helens of people disappearing. Now our website is NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. Doesn't cost you anything to watch this. I give it to you for free. I give you my time for free. If you find it in yourself that you could help us by reading a book or purchasing the book and donating it to your library, I'd be grateful. So, St. Helens. 
Some of the articles on this specific incident state it this they started up for the mountain on July 5th. Other articles state it was July 6th. And there were four of them, the guide, Randolph, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. They started off early in the morning. There was still some snow on the side of the mountain. And the guide said that they would all stay together and they took off for the summit. His job was to bring them back safely as a group. Clinton and Iris, husband and wife, sort of stayed together the whole time. This was the only photo, and I know it's not very good, I apologize, but this was the only photo of either one that I could find. This was Iris. Super smart intellect. Super smart. Originally from Minnesota and went to the University of Minnesota. And for 1913, going to the university and getting a degree was no small task. Now, a report later filed by the guide for law enforcement, the guide George Williams, indicated that Iris had a difficult time keeping up with the three men in the group as they climbed the mountain. Now, if you've never done this, climbing a big mountain, first of all, you're going uphill. And you're going uphill into thinner and thinner air. You have to breathe harder and harder to get the same amount of oxygen in your system. Well, the weather started out really good and everything was fine. And William said he watched and slowly the summit started to get clouded in. Not a big deal. A lot of times mountains get clouds. It doesn't mean anything until you get there and you check it out. Well, as they got closer to the sur summit, things started to get a little hairy. 500 feet from the summit, light rain and wind started to hit the group. 100 feet from the summit, rain and sleet and thick clouds were all around them. And they walked a little bit more from 100 feet, and George said that they were maybe 50 to 70 feet from the summit, they could, they could essentially see it. When 50 mile an hour to 60 mile an hour winds suddenly engulfed all of them. And he said the winds were so strong that Mrs. Smith had a tough time even standing up. So those are dangerous conditions. Here's why. Many times when you're climbing, you're climbing over and standing on thin rocks rocks that have ice on them, rocks, rocks that could be next to a cliff, wind could blow you right off. You got to be concerned. Well, they're in that 50 to 70 foot range from the summit and Williams wrote that he had a difficult time communicating with the climbers because the wind was so hard. Williams said that he told Clinton who was closest to him that they had to turn back. Again, 50 to 70 feet from the summit. And he said Clinton originally ignored him, but he thought he heard him and he thought he just wanted to go anyhow. This is a famous thing in climbing. Hurry to get there. We're close, we can make it, we can go. But when you're in those conditions, 99% of the time it'll only get worse. The guide made the right decision. And when you're a novice at this, you think, well, you know what? This may be my only time there. I'm just going to go for it anyhow. And so those decisions that will kill you. Well, William said, no, we're going back. And so they all decided that they were going to turn around. Snow started to get heavier. William stated that he had a hold of Randolph. And together, he and Randolph started to plow their way through the fresh snow downhill. And he said, uh, Iris, Smith's wife, said, well, maybe we can just slide down part of that mountain on the fresh snow that we had to climb up. And George said, part of that will be possible because there are no 
crevasses on this side of the mountain. But we're just going to keep plowing down on the trail going downhill. Guys, just stay behind me. And he said that he and Randolph stumbled, made their way down. It was rough. They had about 50 foot of visibility. And it kept getting better the lower they got. He said he continually looked behind him and the Smiths were right behind him. And he said maybe 500 feet to 1,000 feet below where they were near the summit, he turned around for like the fifth time and bango, the Smiths weren't there. He said he stopped, walked backwards a few feet, couldn't see anything anywhere. Winds were howling, you couldn't yell for anyone. He was afraid for Randolph's life, and he said, we got to go. So he went downhill. And he guided Randolph down to the point where they started the climb, which was a logging camp. And when they got down there, it was snowing, windy, rain. Uh, essentially, a brutal storm had settled in on St. Helens. He told the logging camp that he needed help and they sent people into Kelso into Portland to get more assistance. The next day they started off and they went up the way they came looking for the Smiths. They had about 50 searchers from the logging camp which was shut down in an effort to find them. People knew the Smiths were important people. They were a young, brilliant couple kind of the up and coming group in Portland. And so they poured a huge effort out on this. July 8th, word got to Kelso in Portland and more assistance came. The storm was still continuing. Williams, was con Williams told the group that he was convinced they were both off that mountain and down somewhere near the logging camp. The reason he said that is that he believed they were right behind him. So, go back to this picture real quick. Mount St. Helens, in that photo right there, you can't see any trees. Much of the mountain doesn't have anything on it. So, at the bottom of the mountain is where Timberline starts, and you get some big trees. Well, July 9th through the 13th, 50 to 70 searchers combed that mountain daily, found nothing. And then on July 14th, searchers found two sets of tracks coming off the mountain and entering the timber in Tootle County. They followed the tracks into the woods and they lost them. They just kind of evaporated away and stopped. Many people thought that had to be the Smiths. And they just had to find them. Number one, there was two people, two sets of tracks. So they kept looking and they had a group there and they had a group on the side of the mountain. On the southwest side, and that would be the side of the mountain that sort of faces Kelso, about halfway up Mount St. Helens, at about the 4,500 foot level, searchers found Clinton's body. They theorized that he fell and broke his neck and broke his arm and died instantly. So they spent a good part of the time after that just looking for Iris because everyone believed with 100% certainty she had to be within 50 feet of that body because they were together. And they all thought, well, maybe he just stepped off the side of the mountain in the wrong place, tumbled down and broke his neck. Okay. Well, they searched that whole afternoon. They didn't find anything. July 16th. As searchers were going up towards where Clinton's body was, they were a thousand feet below it, and they came across Iris's body 
in an area that they had combed before on the way to Clinton's body. They said that it was seemingly uninjured, but she was deceased. And many articles stated, quote, the body was in a very good state of preservation. What? What? Now, let's go backwards a little bit. George had stated that Iris had a difficult time keeping up with the men. She was last seen right next to Clinton, holding on to each other. That's why they believed they would both be at the same location if they fell off the mountain. But Iris was a thousand feet away. That's a lot on a mountain. She didn't fall. She was able to make it down the mountain ahead of Clinton? It was stated at the time that it was believed she died of exhaustion and hypothermia. I've stated this before. Some of you wish to argue with me, but that's fine. Exhaustion? You don't see that these days as a comma, cause of death. Oh, I've been exhausted a few times on climbs. But exhaustion doesn't kill you. Heart attack, hypothermia. And they said maybe she did die of hypothermia, but they didn't know. And the best I could tell is they had their funeral afterwards and there was never a mention of an autopsy. Again, in 1913, maybe autopsies weren't so advanced. So here's a few questions. William said that the Smiths were right behind him. And then suddenly, boom, they were not there. Point of separation. First of all, how did they separate? Let's say I'm one of the Smiths, and let's say I was with Angie. I guarantee you I'm going to be having my arm around her and dragging her off that mountain, but we're not going to lose sight of our guide because he knows the safe way down the mountain. Clinton was smart. He hired that guide for a reason. He knew that guide was the lifeline. He knew not to lose him. And then the storm went on for 10 days. It's a long time for a July storm to sit on one of those mountains. So you have point of separation, you have weather, and you have a cluster zone of strangeness on St. Helens. I can't explain to you enough how strange that mountain is. A lot of it has subsided since the 1980 eruption. Not sure why or what happened or why that would change the paradigm of that mountain, but it did. So, the Smiths, quite much to the story when you get down into the nitty gritty of it. I greatly appreciate you being here please make sure you are subscribed. And I've stated this before, I'm going to say it one more time. The last two videos I put up show that the average watch time of the video is less than half the time of the video. I don't know what to make of that. Many of your comments in past videos have helped me a lot saying, hey, I don't believe it, Dave. I always watch the video to the end, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I greatly appreciate you like you just don't know. So in the meantime, I think H-U-C-K is asleep. <laughs> She's still right here. I'll give you another look. Oh, oh, she's stretching. Just put her head down. She's zonked. Give her a bath today so she's all nice and fluffy and white. And uh, when we got water all over her, she's actually kind of thin. What you're seeing is all the fluff from all that hair. So you guys be safe. 
Thanks for everything. Politis out.